Are you looking for something a bit different in the family SUV segment, but you need a vehicle that's practical, spacious, and has true off-road capability? Well, this is the latest version of the Subaru Outback. And in today's review, I'll tell you why you should consider this as your next family car. Since the launch of the first generation model in 1995, the Subaru Outback has been a celebrated 4x4 offering thanks to its clever combination of passenger and SUV body styles. As such, it's carved out an interesting place in the market, appealing to buyers who are looking for something that's versatile and roomy that isn't your typical bulky by numbers family SUV. Sadly, the Outback has struggled to find success in the UK, recording low sales over the last few years. As a result, Subaru hopes this latest sixth generation model will entice buyers with more advanced technology, exceptional interior space, and impressive safety credentials. As such, Subaru has completely streamlined the Outback lineup to make that point of entry as accessible as possible. There's three clearly defined trim levels and just a single petrol option available. So is the Outback as fun to drive on the road as it is off the beaten track? And how does it compare to other jacked up estate cars like the V60 and V90 cross country, plus genuine off-roaders like the Toyota Land Cruiser? Let's find out. But before we do, click that pop-up banner above to head over to our website and check out our hottest offers available on the Outback. And make sure to subscribe for more of OSV's in-depth vehicle reviews. The design of the Outback combines familiar Subaru traits with that estate car form factor. And as a result, it's a really effective look in 2022, in my opinion, but let me know your thoughts in the comments. With the Subaru logo prominently displayed on this gloss black and chrome grille, it looks like nothing else out there, very rugged, reinforcing that outdoor appeal. We also have rugged plastic black front bumpers and more chrome strips along the uh, bottom air intake there. LED headlights with adaptive high beam and low beam come as standard, ensuring that you've got maximum visibility for nighttime driving, and that's complemented by the front LED fog lamps too. The side profile exudes a dynamic silhouette thanks to these prominent wheel arch extensions and side skirts, also reinforcing the car's rugged appeal. As standard, you get 18-inch dark grey alloy wheels. In fact, 18-inch is the only size wheels that you can get with the Outback, but I'm fine with that. They do a nice job at absorbing light undulations around town. Climb up the range with higher spec grades and you'll get dark metallic wheels, which look rather imposing. Body colour door mirrors come as standard with built-in indicators. They're heated as well and with top spec touring models, they're also folding when you park and the passenger mirror will tilt down slightly when reversing to help you negotiate out of that tight gap. They look a bit different here with this top spec touring model as we've got a silver trim around there and around the doors as well and on the roof rails. Just get some additional exterior styling with that high spec grade. Other exterior highlights include rear privacy glass on the passenger window plus these roof rails that come as standard providing additional overhead storage for skis, paddle boards, canoes etc. The maximum load capacity up here is 100 kilograms with this top spec touring model. As standard it's around 67.5 kg. Housed between the roof rails with this top spec grade is a power operated sunroof letting lots of light into the cabin on a bright summer's day like today. In terms of dimensions, the length of the Outback is 4,870 millimetres, so it's 200 millimetres longer than the VW Golf Alltrack, but just a bit shorter and narrower than the Audi A6 Avant. It's 50 millimetres wider than the V90 Cross Country, and ground clearance is an excellent 213 millimetres. That's on par with the Range Rover Vogue and Jaguar F-Pace, and just a few millimetres shy of the Toyota Land Cruiser. Well, I found an umbrella, so let's keep going. I uh, really like the design of this muscular rear and chunky LED tail lights merging out from the sides here and working their way across the tailgate. Quite a prominent roof spoiler, and that's further complemented by more plastic use for the rear bumper. It's a nice effect, especially when in combination with this autumn green metallic shade. There's a variety of different color options available, guys. If you'd like to dive into those, then do get in touch with our team. 
You get an automatic tailgate with field and touring models, making that fly open automatically. And once it's done so, you're rewarded with 561 litres of space here. That's 10 litres more than the V90 Cross Country and just 50 litres shy of the VW Golf All Track. The conveniently square shaped boot makes it incredibly easy to load those awkwardly long and wide items into the back. In fact, it's enough space here for around five to six carry on luggage or three to four larger adult suitcases. And as you can see, the loading lift is fairly low for a vehicle of this class. So larger animals like dogs shouldn't have a problem jumping in. And there's not much of a lift to heft those heavy shopping bags over to get them into the back. There's quite a few practicality features in the back of this space here. Lots of hooks dotted around to attach objects to the floor. To the right hand side of me, we've got a netted compartment, perfect for objects like to roll around. Got a 12 volt socket there as well. There's a very generous amount of underfloor storage. If you lift that up, you're rewarded with a couple of compartments, plenty of room there for shopping bags, dog walking bits and bobs. Yeah, very versatile and practical. The tonneau cover here comes with a pop-out function like so, and it feels pretty sturdy, actually. You could balance a couple of objects up on there. It's just a shame there's no dedicated storage area for this under the boot floor, so you could free up more room inside here and pile it high. To fit all your outdoor stuff in the back here, you may need to fold down the rear seats, and we can do just by toggling the levers to either side there. The seats will then fold down in a 60-40 arrangement, rewarding you with 1,822 litres in total. But bear in mind, that's going to be 70 litres less if you've opted for the sunroof like we have. As you can see, guys, it's folded completely flat. It's nice and flush with the floor. There's no awkward gap there, meaning you can slide your bikes through, camping equipment, straight into the cabin, and you won't have to worry about faffing around from there. My one complaint though, I wish we had 40-20-40 split folding seats as an option. It's not available with the Outback. That will allow you to then fold down the seats independently from one another. Say, for example, we could fold down that middle seat and slide objects through while still having a couple of passengers in the back. That would have been especially useful. The Outback has a brake towing capacity of 2,000 kilograms, one of the best capacities offered from a vehicle of this class, making it very convenient to tow a large trailer or small caravan. So yeah, really impressed with the practicality on offer, guys. But what about the drive? Is it as capable on-road as it is off-road? Let's take a look. Okay, guys, Subaru has kept the powertrain lineup for the Outback nice and simple. There's just a single engine option here as the two litre diesel has been completely dropped from the lineup now. What we have under the bonnet then is the 2.5i Boxer. That comprises a four cylinder petrol engine mated to CVT automatic transmission. An eight speed manual mode can be activated by the paddle shifters behind the steering wheel. What's really interesting about this CVT is that Subaru has programmed in artificial steps to reduce power briefly, giving the impression that the car has made a gear change. And that makes the Outback feel surprisingly smooth and leisurely to drive around town, much more so than the majority of its rivals. Of course, the Outback is all wheel drive. Power is sent to all four wheels to maximize grip and stability on a variety of terrain, specifically snow, mud, and sand. And this is paired nicely with the active torque split system whereby torque distribution is controlled between the front and rear axles to ensure grip is maximized at all times. Let's dive into the performance figures then. The engine produces 166 horsepower and 252 newton meters of torque for a decent 0 to 62 time of 10.2 seconds. Now that is sluggish compared to this car's main rivals and I think that's just due to the lack of torque on offer for an off-roader. It simply needs more power in order to set off and stand still at a faster pace, you'll find that you won't be able to nip into gaps in traffic as efficiently as some of this car's rivals, like the Volvo V90 Cross Country, that can do zero to 60 in 7.9 seconds, or even high spec variants of the VW Golf All Track that can do zero to 60 in 6.8 seconds. Top speed is 120 miles per hour, and unfortunately, if you are looking for an off-roader that delivers maximum fuel efficiency, then there are better options out there than the Outback. Subaru claims you'll achieve up to 33 miles per gallon on the combined cycle, and CO2 emission is quite high too, at around 193 grams per kilometer. For business customers, this places the Outback in the highest 37% benefit in kind company car tax band for 2022 to 2023. 
Indeed, if you're looking for good fuel economy returns from your off-road SUV, then do look more towards the Suzuki S-Cross as it has a hybrid system paired with the petrol engine to maximize fuel efficiency and reduce that CO2 output. You can find out more about that very capable SUV by clicking the pop-up banner above to watch our review. The Outback comes equipped with a start-stop system whereby the engine cuts out completely at standstill in order to help maximize fuel economy. And this works quite smoothly. Just put your foot down on the accelerator and the car just gets going again quite quickly. It's just a shame about the MPG figure. I wish this was more efficient. Though, taking a look at my dash now, I am averaging 36.2 miles per gallon, a little bit higher than Subaru's claim figure. The Outback comes equipped with a few different driving modes. By clicking the SI button to the right-hand side of the steering wheel, you can switch between the sport and intelligent modes. The intelligent mode is essentially the car's eco mode that will help you maximize fuel economy for whether you're driving around town or on a long journey. And sport will provide instant throttle response when winding down through country roads, making it a much more engaging motor than normal. Though if you are looking for a fun to drive and quite sporty driving experience, you're not gonna get that with the Outback. Look more towards rivals like the Ford Puma or VW alternatives. Then we have the X mode. Regardless of which one you go for, hill descent control will be activated and that will help you maintain a steady speed when traveling downhill. We've got snow and dirt. That will help you maintain traction and stability on snowy, dirty or gravelly terrain. And snow and mud will help prevent wheel slip in soft conditions. Subaru claims improvements made to the chassis and suspension have optimized handling performance and ride comfort. But sadly, the excellent ground clearance at the Outback delivers to tackle any kind of off-road terrain compromises ride quality on normal roads. Around town, the car struggles to absorb the impact of harsh abrasions like pesky potholes. You'll hear a thump resonate throughout the cabin and some vibration as well. And that's due to the jacked up suspension and the small 18 inch alloy wheels. Driving over light undulations though, like small humps and bumps, the car does a decent job at absorbing these, making for a somewhat cosseting ride when quickly dropping the kids off at school or running to the shops. Subaru has increased the rigidity of the body and the front suspension, and because the engine is positioned lower down than the conventional unit, the L-back has a low center of gravity and balance weight distribution that delivers exceptional handling and poise for a vehicle of this class. Body lead is still noticeable, but that is part of the course for an SUV, but it's made much less prominent here thanks to these side bolsters that do a great job at holding you in place through corners and tight turns. I really like the weight applied to the steering. It's light, but it's not too light, providing a good amount of feel from the wheels. That makes this rather long SUV quite easy to manoeuvre around town, especially into and out of tight parking spaces. However, the steering is not as precise or responsive as more sporty driving SUVs like the VW Golf All Track. And while grip is excellent thanks to the all wheel drive system, it doesn't instill much confidence when driving and winding down through a country road. It, that's just to say that there are more engaging motors out there. Brief note on the pedals, they are strong, sturdy and responsive, making it very easy to gauge how much pressure is needed in order to slow down to a standstill or accelerate from speed. Subaru claims its revised configuration has helped reduce noise and vibration inside the cabin, but it's not kept to an absolute minimum, unfortunately. Those 18-inch wheels do a pretty nice job at preventing excessive road noise from seeping inside. The main issue for me comes with the engine. Under harsh acceleration and at lower revs, it sounds quite unpleasant and coarse at times. And that start-stop system, while brilliantly implemented, does sound rather abrupt, disrupting any kind of relaxing experience that you had going on. There is some wind noise coming from around the mirrors and the windscreen at higher speeds too. The Outback offers excellent visibility thanks to a high riding position, thin side pillars that don't obscure your view that much at junctions and traffic lights, large mirrors that can have blind spot monitoring integrated to alert your vehicles passing close by, and a great over the shoulder view thanks to lots of rear quarter glass eliminating where blind spots would otherwise be. Plus the view out the back window is pretty good for a car that combines estate and SUV body styles. If you opt for the top spec touring model, you 
you benefit from the front and side view monitor that uses cameras mounted to the front grille as well as one on the passenger door mirror to help you avoid obstacles when trekking off-road. The Outback was awarded five stars for safety by Euro NCAP scoring very highly in the adult and child occupant categories. It also scored a whopping 95% in safety assist performance which is one of the best results across all vehicle classes. As standard, you benefit from automatic emergency braking, lane departure warning and keep assist, adaptive cruise control and traffic sign recognition. Optional safety features available with higher spec grades include reverse automatic braking, blind spot monitoring, rear cross traffic alert and the multi-view monitor. Subaru's warranty is pretty standard, it's 3 years or 60,000 miles whichever comes first. You also get 12 years of anti-perforation coverage, certainly not as extensive as Hyundai's 5 year unlimited mile warranty or Kia's class leading 7 year warranty. I'm really impressed with the material quality inside the new Outback. While it's not as showy as equivalent rivals, indeed a lot of the materials present here are quite familiar, they're used to great effect. There's lots of plastics, but these are complemented by soft touch trims on the dashboard, also complemented by grey stitching there. We've got a gloss black infotainment cluster surrounded by chrome trim, which is also present on the doors and gear selector. It's a really nice effect and it makes this cabin feel just that little bit more premium than some of its other off-road contemporaries. The front space is wide, giving you plenty of room to stretch out and find a comfortable driving position. Headroom's great, that's despite getting the power-operated sunroof that's available with top spec touring models. Legroom's pretty good as well because the driver's seat is eight-way electrically adjustable as standard plus you get lumbar support that allows six footers to easily find a comfortable position that suits them whether that's a lofty view of the road ahead or they like a more engaging drive by sitting down low that is certainly an option there. My only complaint is with the rear view mirror that's mounted quite low down on the windscreen it's practically in my face obscuring a little bit of my view of the left hand side there but over the last model the windscreen windshield has been extended slightly and so have the front windows making it feel a little bit more breathable and less claustrophobic than its predecessor. Black fabric seats come as standard, upgrade to mid-spec field trims and you get water repellent synthetic leather seats and the top spec toy models reward you with these Nappa leather seats I'm finding to be exceptionally comfortable whether that's driving around town or on longer journeys and those longer journeys are helped by the lumbar support that also comes as standard. I would like this to be fully adjustable though it's just adjustable in one fixed place it's a shame you can't have this climb up the chair to address particular pain points. The front and rear seats come with a heated function as standard and touring models also add the memory function and that allows you to assign your seating configuration to a profile on the driver door. You can set that so when you hop into the car next you won't have to faff around just press that button and it will set it up all for you as you like. So that's ideal if you share your Outback with a colleague or your partner. As standard you get a leather wrapped steering wheel which feels nice and grippy adding to that premium nature of the cabin and I also like the grey stitching running along the inside. With filled trims beyond this is also heated perfect for cold winter mornings. Behind the wheel we have a tiny five inch or so display housed between traditional speedometer and rev counter dials. This shows very basic driving information while on the go such as a digital speed counter, your average fuel economy data and when you switch between the different driving modes this will also pop up on that tiny display. This is complemented by Subaru's new infotainment setup comprising an 11.6 inch tablet like display. It's full HD and you get DAB radio, Bluetooth and wired Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. I'm really impressed with what Subaru have done here. While the UI, the design of this is a bit outdated, looks like from about 10 years ago and the graphics aren't as sharp as Volvo systems which obviously given the design of this it borrows a lot of inspiration from. The icons are nice and large so they're really easy to see while on the go and it's pretty responsive too which means you won't find yourself faffing around too much while on the move. The screen is predominantly controlled via touch and it's fairly responsive to your inputs. Field and touring models come with satellite navigation. This is the display here. We can pinch to zoom like so. You can see there's some delay there, but not too bad at all. And it's nice and smooth as we scroll around like that. You can also use voice recognition if that's your thing.
The infotainment is complemented by standard six speaker system, which sounds fine, but if you upgrade to this touring model, you benefit from the 11 speaker Harman Kardon sound system, which is one of the best premium audio setups in any new car. There's a couple of things I don't like about the display. The first one is that Apple CarPlay and Android Auto is a wired connection, not wireless. The second one is that some of the climate controls are incorporated into the screen itself. Thankfully, not all though. We do have some physical buttons on the side to adjust the temperature. Air intensity though, you'll have to dive into the display and it can be a bit fiddly to adjust this while on the move. But overall, I think the screen strikes a nice balance between physical and virtual controls. We do have physical buttons for adjusting the volume and tuning for the radio. Plus, we can easily clear the front and rear windscreens and all the more advanced controls are located inside the screen and they are easily accessible too as the layout is nice and easy. Working our way down, we have an AUX port and a couple of USB ports accompanied by the electronic parking brake. Also got a decently sized cubby for a smartphone, though it does look quite tight. So one of those larger devices may not fit in there. And sadly, there's no wireless charging pad option with the Outback. Behind that, we've got a button to activate the rear parking camera at any time at slow speeds. And we have the gear selector prominently displayed in the center. The front passenger has a nice cubby here to the side of the center console to put spare change and other bits and bobs. A couple of cup holders, really nice size to these. You can fit pretty much any kind of bottle in there, especially my bulky one fits nice and snug. We'll open up the center compartment here and you've got a tray there for loose change and pieces of gum. Pull that up and we've got a nice deep cavernous central compartment there. It goes down really far, perfect for odd bits and bobs. But sadly, there's nothing else in there. No additional USB port or 12 volt socket. The glove box is a decent size. It's wider than it is thin. And as you can see, the manual is taking up a lot of the space there. You do get a sunglasses compartment up here. Love it when you get that. And the door bins are an okay size. The plastic used for these are pretty cheap, which actually works out quite well because they're pretty flimsy. So you can easily shove in a bulky bottle like this. The longer wheelbase than the previous model has enhanced rear passenger space to a great degree. Indeed, there's plenty of room at the back here for two adults or three kids. Leg room is exceptional. I can stretch out all the way and I've still got some way to go. Really, really good indeed. Knees don't come up too high either. And headroom's good too, so I'm 5'8 once again. And I'm quite a way off the top of that roof lining. Though if I sit at an angle like so, you'll see this is where the headlining starts to slope down towards the rear passenger door so I could collide with that if I'm six foot or over worth bearing in mind. Unlike a lot of rivals the rear seats can recline extending headroom slightly for six footers and making those seats a little bit more comfortable for longer journeys. You also get a middle compartment here that you can fold down warding you with a generously sized central armrest and a couple of cup holders though these are fairly small not enough space for my bulky bottle actually it kind of fits but that's easily going to fall all that while on the go. More ideal for a coffee cup or something like that. If you need to load kids or elderly passengers into the back, then you'll be pleased to know that the doors open nice and wide around 65 to 70 degrees. Thanks to the high roof line and low loading seals, elderly passengers will easily be able to hop into the back here. You can also then attach kids seats to Isofix fittings on either bench. Other niceties include pouches on the back of the front seats that will be upholstered in the leather with your ideal configuration. It doesn't go down particularly far, but it feels nice and sturdy. You could fit quite a lot in there. The door bins are pretty much the same size in the back as they are in the front. Once again, my bulky bottle does fit, but it is a bit of a tight squeeze. And we also benefit from an air conditioning cluster whereby we can adjust the air intensity in the back, but not the temperature. We get a couple of USB-A ports and we've got the buttons here for the heated rear seats. Okay, let's check out the middle seat. You know what, comfort wise, that's actually pretty good. It's not as plush and supportive as the other seats, but I could sit here for about an hour or so, I think. Leg room is slightly compromised, well, I'll say slightly, quite a bit compromised by the large central tunnel running into the rear cabin space here. So middle passengers will have to find places for their feet. And the middle seat does sit slightly higher than the other two. So six footers will be touching the top. But other than that, not too bad at all. Right, let's dive into pricing now. We'll also explore the three different trim levels available with the new Outback. 
entry level limited models start from £35,995 and you get these 18 inch alloy wheels, automatic LED headlights with high beam assist, plus the reversing camera assisted by rear parking sensors. From around £40,000 you can upgrade to the mid-range field model that exudes more of an off-road feel than the standard car. You'll benefit from a gloss black exterior styling pack and inside you get water repellent leather seating plus a sat nav for the infotainment system. This touring model maximises your configuration from just £41,500. You get auto folding door mirrors, that 12 speaker premium Harman Kardon sound system and these extremely comfortable Nappa leather seats with memory function. There's also multiple accessories available to tailor the Outback to your requirements such as a cargo step panel, side sill plates and LED tailgate illumination. To dive into these options in more detail guys and find the trim that suits your needs perfectly just get in touch with our team via the link below. Okay guys, should you buy, lease or finance a Subaru Outback? Well, after my test drive, I have to say that I feel that this is a rather underappreciated offering in the SUV segment. Not only does it deliver true off-road capability, excellent stability and traction control on various terrain types, but it has a lot of things that family car buyers are looking for too. Really impressed with the interior quality. It's also very spacious inside for passengers and luggage. Very comfortable for those long journeys. It's generously well equipped to standard and you benefit from an impressive array of safety features among the best in its class. Even if you're not bothered about the off-road capabilities of the Outback, I still think it's really worth a look as it's gonna tick a lot of the boxes for you and it's competitively priced with less capable rivals. For me the downsides factor into the driving experience that excellent ground clearance compromises ride comfort meaning this isn't as relaxing to drive as other family SUVs out there. The engine also feels a bit underpowered and those fuel economy figures simply aren't good enough they're quite poor and it could be more confident when handling sharp bends and corners it's certainly not the most engaging motor out there. But overall, I've been pleasantly surprised by the Outback. I think it's a fantastic offering in this segment and it's definitely worth adding to your list. If this review has got you interested in the Outback guys and you have a few questions, then be sure to give our team a call via the number in the banner below. We'll be happy to provide any information that you need. Alternatively, just click the pop-up banner up there to book a consultation call at a time that best works for you. Also, there's a link down below in the description. If you click that, you can head over to the O3 website and check out the latest offers that we have available on this capable off-road SUV. Thanks for watching, guys. If you enjoyed the review, give it a thumbs up. Also subscribe to OSV if you haven't already done so. We really appreciate that. And once you're on board, be sure to click the notification bell. It's hanging out down there somewhere. That way you'll be able to keep up to date with our in-depth vehicle reviews. But that's it. I'm going to get out of the rain now. See you next time. Safe driving.